excited to share this learning from our challenge projects with you. Um, I'll be giving you a quick overview of the Hideki sent the link to Dion <laughs> because he's the first speaker. Um, I'll uh, thanks. I'll uh, I'm here to welcome you. After that, uh, the plan is to hand over to our CEO Dion Nell to give a brief update on where we're at with the GRP. Um, then I'll hand over to Jasper Hornberg, our scaling and incubating leads, to give us a bit of his vision and view on scaling learning, all that. After that, we'll have Sarah from iTouch joining us uh, to reflect on the lessons from the two case studies that we're presenting here today. Um, Dave Wilson's unfortunately cannot join, but we're great. it's great to have Sarah here with us. Then we'll learn uh, about reflections from our grantees, uh, this is Peter from Groundswell, and hopefully some others are willing to share as well. If so, just let us know. And then we'll have some Q&A. Um, in between, to keep it a bit interactive, we also have a polling question set up. So I just hope the tech will work for that. Okay, but first, uh, some rules of the game. Um, as always, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. So if you keep it a bit uh, orderly. Do not uh, sh share a video, please. And we'll turn your video off if you're, um, if you're showing it because we want to save the bandwidth um, because we had quite a few registrations for this webinar. Um, if you have any questions or any reflections or lessons or stories to share, uh, please type them in the chat box uh, to everyone. Um, we'll get to the questions at the end of the present of the webinar. If you um, have any tech issues, technical issues, then please contact either or Anastasia via private message and they'll try to sort you out. To preempt one question, um, the slides, the case studies, as well as this recording uh, of this webinar will be circulated afterwards. And if you have uh, an appetite for further learning about what we have been up to as the Global Resilience Partnership, then I'd highly recommend you to visit the GRP uh, Resilience Insights website, which uh, was launched this year. A final disclaimer uh, before handing over to Dion, if he has joined, um, that this webinar is being recorded and by participating, you do give consent uh, for your recording. Yes, Dion is there and happy to hand over to him. Take it away. Thank you so much, Simone. How many people do we have online? 50 people. Almost. Excellent. Well, that's, that's great to have so many people. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Dion Nell. I'm the, the CEO of uh, the Global Resilience Partnership. Really great to uh, to be with you. So welcome to the seminar. I can see by the, the turnout that this is um, a topic that I think many of us resonate with. And so um, I, I'm hoping that this can be very informative. I think I think many of us have, have become jaded and uh, with these uh, uh, seminars and, and meetings of uh, that are full with overinflated claims of our own successes. And I think you, know, you go to uh, um, a meeting and, 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 and leader after leader, business leader or NGO stands up and, and talks about how well their initiatives are, are doing. And, and I think, you know, if, if, if we were doing so well, we wouldn't be sitting with the high levels of inequality and, and facing a, a climate and biodiversity crisis. So I, I do think many of us are, are longing for a, a more honest conversation that allows us to to get better at what we do and, and to move forward uh, towards uh, our goals and our aspirations in, in a more meaningful way. So it's great to, great to have you uh, with you, uh, with, with us here today. Um, I think failure is, is, is a much better teacher than success. And, and learning from failure, I think, requires a, not only a brutal honesty, um, and this, this is an honesty that perhaps our programmatic and funding systems don't really allow for, and, and, and perhaps also is not encouraged uh, amongst uh, our, our peer community. So hopefully this can be a start of something like that, where a peer community can um, start talking you know, more meaningfully about, about failure and, and how we can improve, uh, improve our work. Um, but I think it's, it doesn't only require um, a, a more brutal honesty uh, about our work, but it also requires a level of boldness and risk taking and, uh, and an orientation towards uh, action. Uh, if we're being too cautious and we're moving too slowly, we're, we're obviously unlikely to fail. So we have to push the boundaries if we're wanting to uh, learn. And, and with that risk comes a risk of failure. So 
I think this is this is the kind of space we're, we're looking for. And I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been very instructive in this in this way. Now, uh, I'm sure many will argue that a, a global pandemic caused by zoonotic diseases was was predictable, but it, it has created a novel situation, an unprecedented situation, and uh, one that has caught the global community off guard and introduced a, a large amount of uncertainty. And um, I, I think back of the, you know, the words of David Nabarro, who I think many of us know quite well, the, the WHO special envoy on, on uh, COVID-19. And his, his words in, in, in mid-March, when uh, there was uh, you know, quite a lot of panic happening, you know, his words were, act quickly, act decisively, act without regrets, but be, 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 be prepared uh, to learn fast and adapt uh, uh, quickly. So I, I think we're moving into this period of, of greater uncertainty, of greater volatility, um, where these sorts of shocks are likely to become become uh, uh, more of a normal. So I, I think the the new ways of working, of, of erring on the side of action, being honest about our failures and learning as quickly as possible are, are the ways that we, we will need to uh, get better at. Um, and then obviously moving on to the second part of this conversation with, with all of you, uh, how do you then scale those things? So the things that are working, how, how do we, we scale those quickly? And I think there's also a, a misconception that, you know, once you've uh, innovated and you've perhaps made your failures and learned quite quickly, then you move into the scaling phase where you just invest a, a bunch of resources and things go to scale. Um, I think one needs to recognize that, that learning is a continuous process. Uh, that you will continue to fail through that scaling process, and you will need to uh, continue to learn through that uh, that uh, that that process as well. So, I think this is something which um, we we need to embrace as well. So, hoping you guys are going to have a, a a great discussion. Looking forward to to hearing uh, from from you all. Thank you to Simone, Jesper, and the team for putting this together. Special thanks to Dave Wilson, who unfortunately can't be with us today. Um, but Sarah's with us, so thank you, Sarah, for, for your contributions from ITAD. Uh, the, organi the participating organizations such as Mercy Corps, Groundswell, uh, One Architecture, IFPRI, uh, Mahila Housing Trust, and, and Producer, Producers Direct who contributed case studies to this work. So thank you very much for your contributions. And then obviously, much of this work was uh, funded by USID, so it's a big uh, thank you to them. Simone, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, hand back to you. Thanks, Jan. Uh, great, great for sharing that with us. Um, some words that speak, speak really to the case studies and our findings there. Um, I just had a slide up for of our partners as well, um, who are important for all the work we do, of course, as well. Um, before handing over to Jasper, um, I think we have a poll coming up where we will uh, test your um, interaction and your honesty, if I may say so. Um, we'll just leave this open for about 30 seconds, uh, see how many reactions we get coming in. Um, I can see that. Um, the first one is, of course, a bit of a trick question, perhaps seeing if how honest you are, but also if this poll is actually working. Getting quite a few questions, I think. Like 40 people, a lot of people are at least responding. That's great to see. Yeah, I think we have now about 77% of people voting. Um, it's quite okay. Uh, you have five more seconds to find the vote button. One, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Ida, you can publish the poll. Great, so lots of honesty here. That's good to know. Um, we're all honest. We have all failed. I have failed. Everybody feels it's a part of life and it, it helps us become better at what we do. Um, he has never failed, Simone. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 damn. Love to meet that person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what's also great to see, I think, is that many people strongly agree that failure is needed to innovate. Um, that's something we, we have found in the study, perhaps. Uh, and, and nobody uh, strongly disagrees. So that's great. Um, 
I think this has been a very helpful exercise. Um, let's write down the numbers and hand over to Jesper. Thanks, Jesper. Um, take it away. Thank you, Simon. Uh, very nice to uh, be on this. I was going to say nice to see you all, but I'm not seeing you because you have your video off, which is which is good. But welcome to my office, my uh, lunch room, my library, and my break room and my gym. Uh, it's nice to have you here. Um, I have a very easy job today because because all my work has been done already. Um, uh, Dion said uh, the important bits about failure, the importance of failure, and Sarah will tell you more in detail about. Uh, what we've learned uh, through the process over the past uh, five years at, at GRP, working with a number of different resilience initiatives. But I'll, I'll mention a few things that I, uh, I want to highlight. Um, uh, the vision and purpose of, of, uh, of, of uh, the incubator, the GRP incubator, is what you see on, on, on the slide here. Um, we want to increase resilience among communities, businesses, and in the sector itself. Uh, we want to find new innovative solutions and we want to create more connections so that they can grow and we want to be able to replicate them and, and scale them and expand them. That's very important. Uh, as Dion already mentioned, uh, this is more important than ever. The, the COVID uh, situation has given um, rise to uh, unprecedented numbers in unemployment figures and so on. And we can see that in, in, in Europe and the States. Um, uh, I'm based in Nairobi and we see uh, very big problems arising as a consequence of this. Uh, vulnerable communities, vulnerable countries uh, are the first to be exposed uh, to, these, uh, to these problems. We knew already before, and we sounded a little bit repetitive when we talked about these things, that we needed to think in new ways. We needed to come up with new approaches and we needed to, to work together uh, across uh, different sectors, uh, thinking in new ways, um, and connecting with new ideas uh, and allowing ourselves to fail and break the traditional cycle of pilot testing, pilot testing, pilot testing, and never really learning. And, uh, you know, why do we do that? Why, why, do we, why do we come back and we try the same thing again? And there might be small differences. Well, well as, as Dion already uh, hinted to, it's, it's, it's a systematic problem, really. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's embedded in, in how everything works and how the funding works and that you're not really allowed to talk about failure because if you talk about failure you might not get funding in the future and, and you want to avoid that because you're doing what you're doing based on, on um, that, that's your job and you need to justify that. So uh, when I see that people see the value of failing, um, of having failure, of learning from failure, I think that's fantastic because that's the only thing that will change the way we, we operate things. So what do we do? Next slide, please. Um, the, the incubator wants to identify uh, new innovations. It then wants to support these uh, innovations uh, and initiatives. And then they want, it, it wants to, to bring those things to scale. Now, the first thing we do uh, we, when we find something and we run various uh, uh, competitions and so on to surface these ideas, and we also look for them ourselves, uh, we assess how they build resilience uh, and how they how scalable they are, and we do that in a number of different ways. We are using our approach to what builds resilience, and we evaluate each initiative based on how well they address those things. And very few will address all of them, but at least they address some of them. And they also need to build good resilience. So we don't want to have resilience to change if 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 not changing is a bad thing. Uh, we then uh, look at the scalability of projects here. Um, we look at the user appropriateness. If it is very relevant for the end user, the customer, the beneficiary, whatever term you want to put there, then there's potential to scale. It's something they need and are asking for. Uh, we also look at how sustainable it is. Uh, is the model that is proposed something that can carry itself, either as a business model or as something that, that can be embedded into government structures for infrastructure, for example, something that, that, that reduces the cost to the government and, and reduces the, the maintenance costs and, and so forth moving forward. And then we also look at the scalability. Um, there are many good projects out there that are um, uh, very good at local level, but it's difficult to, to put them somewhere else and have them work. And they're very reliant on individuals, um, particular individuals in that uh, locality. Uh, so we look at that, we assess that. Um, after that, we do a capacity assessment and a gap analysis. 
By that uh, we mean we look at how strong um, uh, an entity, an organization, a group of people are at doing something, and then we map out where are the weaknesses. Um, this, uh, in very close collaboration with the initiative and the people behind it, we, we have an honest discussion about is this something that can be addressed and fixed? Can we help you in any way? And that results in a plan moving forward. Um, the most important thing in, in any, any, the most important change agent uh, in any resilience initiatives that I've come across, or I would say that we've come across, uh, are the people that are doing it. Uh, so we put a lot of focus on, on building those people, supporting those people. Um, uh, we run a leadership academy. Uh, we also connect people with each other, the people that we work with in the initiatives uh, internally for peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, and we also organize things like, uh, we call them investing in resilience forums, where we, we bring those and we make them pitch ready so that they can present their initiatives in a coherent and concise way. Uh, to a relevant audience uh, of potential funders, but not just funding. Funding is important, but, but not the most important thing. The most important thing are, the, again, the people that are doing it. So we connect them to potential partners um, and we continue to work with them. Um, Dean mentioned that, that failure is not something you do once and then you learn and then you're done. It's a continuous process. It's, it, it goes on and on. So it's the mindset that needs to be, that needs to be addressed. Uh, I would be super happy to talk for a very long time about this uh, and only have my own face in the screen, but, but Simone said no to that. So I'm at this point handing over to Sarah, who will take us through um, the case study that they worked on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesper. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks so much for having me here. It's really, um, really great to still be part uh, of the work that GRP has been doing. Um, I've been working with ITAD, who's supporting some of the monitoring, evaluation and learning for GRP. We've been involved since the very beginning. In fact, I have been involved since the very beginning. I was part of that team. Um, and it's been wonderful to see how it's had the developments and sort of different, different iterations over the years. Um, the bit we're here to talk to you today is about some work we've done recently around looking at learning from failure and around scaling. So um, I'm just going to take you through some of that before we get to the interesting bits where we get to hear from people who've actually experienced all of this. Um, can I have the next slide, Simona, please? I'm trying to push my ones. It doesn't work, does it? Thank you. So the first bit is just to start with a brief overview of GRP challenge activity. So um, some of you might know all of this already, but there have been three challenges. Um, all of them have had the idea of scaling in there from the beginning. The idea is to bring to the fore innovative ideas that have the potential to scale. So the three challenges have been um, the USAID Global Resilience Challenge, the Zurich Foundation Water Window Challenge, and the DRP Innovation Challenge. Um, and between them, there's been some incredible outcomes from these, from these challenges. Um, in particular, you know, over 7 million people have been supported by GRP. Next one, Simona. So that of those challenges, there's been 38 challenge projects from 18 different countries across five main intervention areas, which are in relation to nature-based solutions, um, projects which innovations that empower marginalized groups, and then there's been work on inclusive, inclusivity in finance and markets, IT and low-cost infrastructure. Thanks, Simona. And as I was saying before, there's been a lot of monitoring, evaluation, and learning work carried out around um, through GRP right from the very start. It's been a really important part sort of embedded in the whole work of the program as a whole. So understanding how GRP has developed and taking learnings from that and feeding into the development going forward, as well as looking at the outcomes of working um, with the challenge fund uh, winners to understand the impact they're having and the outcomes, the outputs they're seeing. So we've done all these different types of work supporting secretariat around that. And the recent bit, the most recent bit has been around reflective, like development of re reflective and not evaluative, I would say, case studies to look at scaling and learning from failure. So these were based on existing project documentation. So that we, we did quite, we were quite, we thought it was quite important to not always ask people for more and more information all the time. So where possible, we took the lots of information that was gathered from the challenge fund winners and understanding to, to, to get what we could out of that. So we used existing project documentation. We did some more interviews though with um, the challenge projects and also with the Secretariat members to understand what their views were and how this was built into the approaches they took. So as I say, it wasn't evaluative, this is more a reflective piece. 
Um, there were particular challenge win winners who were included in these cases. So there were five um, scaling grantees, who, Groundswell, IFPRI, Mahila Housing Trust, Metameta, and Producers Direct, who were supported in particular around scaling. Um, on top of that, we had some case studies contributed that we pulled out of other um, Mercy Corps Trader and One Architecture, and they were that was they had particularly interesting stories to tell about around what learning they'd taken from failure and from adaptation as we went along. Um, yes, inclusion in the learning from a failure case study in no way indicates projects were a failure, although maybe they were, and that's a good thing. So there we go, that's the main point to be taken from that one. Um, and this was actually, I was going to do a, a poll quiz on this one, but it's up there as a title. So <clears throat> just to start with an understanding of where GRP is coming from with regards to these concepts. <clears throat> so basically, fail stands for first attempt in learning. Well, it does at my children's school anyway. This is like this, this open mindset thing that is taught very much you know, in education nowadays, helping children to understand that if they get something wrong the first time, it's not a bad thing, but it's your first attempt in learning. You do something again, you try it again. And that seems to be something that is okay at schools, but as we get older, that doesn't quite fit with our worldview. It's, it sort of goes out the window and we become increasingly stuck with a, a world in which we have to deliver according to outcomes, according to preset plans. If we go off our plan, then it's a bad thing. <clears throat> as Dion was saying earlier, we are, we're in a current world in which we're having to learn and adapt extremely quickly. And I'm doing a lot of work supporting the NHS in England at the moment to look at rapid learning gathering and how do we take, how do we look at all, there are so many amazingly interesting things that are happening on the ground at the moment in response to COVID-19. So what do we do with that? Do we just let it all happen and disappear? Or do we look at where things are working, learn it and spread and share? And also thinking about the future, what is happening at the moment that has true value so that we don't have to go back to, to repeating our own mistakes, mistakes again. <clears throat> so for GRP, failure is not viewed negatively or is something to penalize projects for, but it was always seen as something that provides an opportunity for learning and improvement. So in particular, we talked as well about the dynamic nature of learning. So that's permeated the entire GRP ecosystem, having a system of sort of continuous learning, which I think has already been mentioned a couple of times. So it's about creating the space to test innovations, take risk and embrace the learning from failure. That's a really important bit that um, was, was put into the sort of the essence of GRP. I remember being there really early on where we talked a lot about the importance of being able to fail, fail quickly, learn from it and move on. Next slide, thanks. Oh, we're on poll, brilliant, okay. Time to wake you all up again. We've got another poll going on here. Um, so our questions are, if we put those up, scaling means to me. So what is scaling about? This is very particularly about scaling. We've got two questions. What does scaling mean to you? There's multiple choice questions there. And then our second question is, has failure helped you to achieve scale? I'd also really like, anybody's got any experiences of how failures helped them, if they can stick that into the chat box. Also, the opposite would be funny. Um, I loved, I saw <laughs> these chat comments do make me laugh though, so I have to ignore them. Claire commented earlier that she organized a conference once and somebody ended up sleeping on the patio, which I thought was a brilliant example of failure and one that would give me nightmares. Um, so yeah, I'll try not to look, look at them too much as they're coming in. How are we doing? We keep going it a bit longer. Right, we've had a minute up there. Let's give it another 10 seconds either, please. Okay, but look at what we got there. So, scaling to me means, right, so our most common is expanding the scope and depth of activities. That's an interesting one. And there's a good majority thinking that failures help them to achieve scale, which is interesting. It's one of the things about doing these case studies and bringing them together is the overlaps between them, which is very much around the issue of learning, which we'll see in a minute. But that, that in relation to scaling, that definition, that, um, yeah, that was one of the things in the next slide, Simona, which is about the different definitions that there are of scaling. And often scaling to people means that it's just about, um, it often, it's often sort of seen in economic terms. It's seen as having more people, more, um, more things, you know, sort of expanding an office or 
putting more money into something. But in fact, there are you know, lots of different definitions of scaling. Um, Simona, can you put the next slide up, please? Thank you. And the definitions that GRP were working on was quite, were quite broad. So they were looking at these four different things of expanding geographically. So you take your activities and you grow them within a country or region. Widening horizontally, which is about adding more closely related functionalities. It's about expanding your activities out just a bit. Replicating geographically, which is the sort of copy, adust, adapt and paste to another country or region, which has a lot of difficulties often, but it's about taking something that's been piloted, tested and proven and moving it somewhere else. And diving vertically, so that's really expanding the scope and depth of activities, which I think quite a few of you mentioned in, in, in your responses to that poll. And in trying to understand how scaling has been supported, we used a framework for scaling um, that builds on various existing theories about how scaling happens. Um, and we looked at three different, we talked about how there being three different stages in scaling. So we've got the bit which is around increasing knowledge of the innovation and raising awareness. So that's when you're really just telling people that it, it exists, that it's there. But that's not enough. As we all know, you know, it, it, it doesn't usually work that you tell somebody that you've got something and they just do it. It's just, it, it, that's not what happens with spread or scaling. It's just way more complicated than that. Because of course, the first thing you have to do, if you tell somebody that you've got a great idea, you then have to work with them to build the will and the ability to implement something. And then finally, you're into creating long-term behavior change through sustainable implementation. So that's about when you make something, help something to fit to somebody's organization, their culture, you're institutionalizing something. So there are different sets of activities relating to all of these different things. And the, the key strand in here is, in particular is around understanding working closely with stakeholders in different contexts, as well as communicating the value, understanding needs. So it's all that, there's a lot of understanding learning elements in there. And if you, you use this type of framework where you break it down into different stages, you can start to understand a bit more about what types of learning you need in order to feed into, different, in, in order to feed into the stages to keep yourself moving through. And we found that the incubator activities could be fit into this framework. So the incubator was working at um, helping at awareness raising level to support grantees to understand how their project works. So really getting that in-depth understanding of what is the bit of your project that is, is working. What, what, is, what do you actually do? It's amazing how difficult it is for people to explain that. Um, but really supporting projects to do that and where the value is added and to help them to really start to plan for scale. So not just, as I said before, not just assuming that you will just tell someone that it's great and they'll do it, or that you'll take it somewhere else and they'll go, yes, thank you, come to me. That's, it, it's, there is more to it than that. So they help them work through those plans. They help them to build the will and ability to implement by doing a lot of work that was really highly valued around connecting people, building networks at different levels, and really keeping communication going, but, and also around improving communications helping people to understand how to communicate well, which again, often seems like it should be evident, but it isn't. And it's about understanding your audiences, your stakeholders and different modes of communication. So there was a lot of work doing around that. And then finally, looking at longer term sustainability and institutionalization of approaches. And they did a lot of work in developing business plans and supporting um, the search for, for additional funding sources where necessary. Next slide, thank you. Um, and this is a dramatic diagram about the valley of death. So um, what it's about is about how GRP supports, ha supports innovative projects to move beyond that, that valley of death cycle, which I think Jesper referred to earlier, which is give it a go, pilot it, test it, find it doesn't work, mm, think, oh dear, what can we totally do? Uh, yes, okay, then, then we tend to maybe abandon it or adapt it slightly. And that's the cycle that people end up in. And it means you end up being an inability to progress to scale. So it's that whole bit about how do we move beyond that value of death. Using learning, using reflection, using an understanding of how we do things in order to get beyond that to be able to do scaling. So as I said before, there was a focus on learning from the start with GRP. There was a focus on um, that whole thing about understanding there is a need for failure. There was close relationships and sort of this continuous assessment idea so that we're not just talking about assessment in terms of results, but assessment of working closely with the secretariat to revisit models, to revisit 
um, action plans to look at the gap analysis that was done with the incubator and to really work with people to understand um, quite in, in these close trusting relationships what is happening what isn't working how can we keep this working and then on top of that as, as was mentioned earlier there was a, work, a whole load of leadership development work which was really important for people working in these very complex areas um, there was a tolerance of failure there was a discussion around it from early on which meant that there was an understanding of the thresholds of failure so we can't do this all the time but if we're going to fail let's think about how we're going to build on that and, and how can we get to a point where we um, are, are starting to scale successfully And this moves us into some of the key lessons and recommendations from both of the case studies. So firstly, with regards to scaling, um, any model, a sustainable model needs to move beyond business and social approaches. So we need to consider volatility of different contexts and in particular, continued participation of the most poor and vulnerable in any of the plans that are being made. Um, for scaling, attention to context is really, really important. So understanding that context um, continually will be shifting with increasing scale, but also that you need to understand your context really well in order to scale. A recognition of the complexity of context. Um, and there's something around that, that working in these very, in this, with this high level of very complex understanding of lots of different contexts, which needs a reflective process of leadership and particularly leadership skills are needed. So you need to work with lots of different people meet lots of different needs, rapidly deal with change and shifting context, and that's where that leadership support was really important. So the other element is about active participation of stakeholders. That was, in, from GRP's perspective, really, really critical to scaling success. That links you back to the context thing, because the stakeholders, it's all about helping to inform you about um, how people view where they live and how, your, how the, the innovation you're talking about fits or might not fit or might need to be adapted to wherever it's going. Um, and so and I'm saying all this fits together. There's this thing about continuous evidence generation and learning being really important. And in order to meet all of that, you need funding support that needs to be flexible, reliable and long term. So that, and that is so key. And I find that in a lot of the work I'm doing in the UK as well. When we're talking about funding innovation, that's a huge conversation, isn't it? Because you end up if you're going to fund innovation, you need to be funding something in a way that is flexible. It needs to allow for failure. You can't have a system in which that doesn't really move on that, you know, things that can't be changed as you go along. Um, and in terms of learning from failure, it, yeah, as we keep saying, we need to learn quickly from failure. That's one of the things. You need to have things set up in place um, right from the start. There needs to be a culture of learning from the start. And there needs to be tools and mechanisms to respond to what you're learning from. That's the other point from this. You can't, just learning is, is fine, but you need to learn and then adapt. So it's that, that next bit and making sure that people are supported to have that in place is important. Working closely with projects, we've talked about these good trusted relationships are very important in a structured way, working in a structured way to build up those relationships and to help people to have these conversations which might otherwise be difficult around what isn't working. Um, there's something in there around sort of mutually identifying failure thresholds, so understanding how does that work how, where is everybody going to be happy with this? What expectations do we have of, of the challenge fund winners to enable that will help them to understand how far they can push things either way? And finally, the bit about considering phasing to allow testing at the right time. So making sure that the cycle, it's almost like cycles within the project that will allow for things to be considered at certain points so that you don't miss those points that need to be looked at. Um, and I think that's me for now. There's these, uh, yeah, these reports, this is just a, a very high level summary of some of the things that have come out of it, some of the learning from this. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot, there's interesting discussions to be had. There's sort of discussion pieces in many ways. Um, and I think it's back to Simone now. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, that was great. Um, really briefly over to me and as I get to the next slide, which is actually from Kronso International as well, picture from the field. Um, Peter, I hope you are there and uh, I'm not sure if maybe, either, yeah, he's there and unmuted. If you want, you can turn on your video. If if that's not possible, then just continue. Go ahead. Yeah, there you are. Great. I'm here, yes. And I can so, hear you. Am I, am I up? Yeah. Okay, my name is Peter Goebbels. I uh, live in and work uh, in West Africa, based in Ghana, northern part of Ghana. 
and I work with Groundswell International. And my role is action learning, director for action learning and advocacy. So learning is part of my mandate. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about our failures in Groundswell in our recent um, initiative with the GRP, but I'd like to just preface that by affirming some of the points that, was made, that were made that reflect our own learning about scaling. Um, the idea of a process for learning, uh, trust, uh, having a flexible project document, um, risk-taking and experimentation, um, the attention to context, and the complexity. All of those things re really resonate strongly with Groundswell's experience. And we work mostly in resilience with farming systems, with small-scale farmers in the Sahel. So we are really looking at resilience from a systems approach. Now, it is much more difficult in our experience to try to scale up when you're dealing with a systems orientation. In our experience with farming, there's not one innovation alone that will transform a farming system to make it resilient, adapted to climate change, uh, uh, sustainable and productive. It, it requires a series of different ones and each of those innovations need to be experimented with and then spread and adapt uh, from farmer to farmer so that farmers can be learning from each other as well and um, uh, through small scale experiments. So um, I just want to give you some example, two or three examples of how we learned this. Um, one, uh -huh. is, one is the example of um, tree planting, which has been very popular in the Sahel. And I remember one of our partners was very proud that they had succeeded in their objective of planting 5,000 trees, putting them into nurseries and then transplanting them. And they, they had, a, I think, a 72% survival rate. But then we, when we did an evaluation or we tried to learn from that, um, even though they were successful in their program, because they didn't have a systems orientation, we found out in the same time scale that they had planted the, the 5,000 trees, overall, the environment, they had maybe lost 20,000 th trees through charcoal and cutting and, and, and degradation. So often we might have a successful innovation that might seem to contribute to resilience, but all you've really done is slow down the rate of uh, slow down the rate of degradation that leads to increasing um, vulnerability. Um, so you need to look at the wider system, not just the planting of the trees, but if uh, the overall environment is degrading, then you're, not, you're, you're just postponing it. Uh, another example was um, the, the use and promotion of successful seed, sesame seed, which um, generate a lot of income and then there was an attempt to to do the value chain orientation but with that as well we found out a number of different problems that if um, if the land on which the sesame is being grown is degrading the soil fertility is, is reducing then the sesame only <laughs> lasts a number of years before you can't grow anymore and also taking it to scale if many people are starting to grow sesame then the price falls and we also found out that um, it was the better off people, farmers that were growing the sesame and it wasn't helping the people that were more vulnerable. So I really think that one of the lessons that we learned in Groundswell is that you need to look, at least in a farming system approach, working with small scale farmers in the context of the Sahel, that you need to look at a process and you need to look at a series of innovations that are sufficient if they are taken together that will start to transform the farming system. One innovation alone will not be sufficient. And it's much more complex when you're trying to scale out a process that has a systems orientation than if you're just trying to scale out one um, apparently useful innovation. So our project with uh, our initiative with uh, resilience with the GRP um, did that. And we looked at the sort of the combination and the sequence and the process and the learning at the communities. And we thought we had something what we call proof of concept 
even though there wasn't enough time really to do the really rigorous evaluation, we had enough data that we thought that we were really helping communities to start to transform their farming systems. So then our project was then really related then, uh, how do you scale this? And our thinking was that we needed to change the, the policy orientation of the governments, both at the local level and at the national level, in order for there to be more support for farmers to engage in this process of what we call agroecology, agroforestry. And um, there is where we, <laughs> we came into a number of challenges. Um, many of our partners, we, we work as a network of partners in four countries in, in West Africa, Senegal, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Ghana, really did not have that capacity to engage in advocacy uh, beyond the local level. At the local government level, they were quite effective and we've made changes there, but not at the national level. And um, in our planning and design, we found out that really we did not give enough time, enough resources, enough support to our partners to then start that process of reaching out to other stakeholders, um, looking at what they were already doing in terms of advocacy, communicating our lessons uh, to them and for them to integrate that into their existing campaigns. And then the different stakeholders that, or, or decision makers that we want to influence there are a number, uh, the big donors, the, the climate change adaptation group platform. There's another platform that deals with resilience called Agir Action Global d'Initiative de Resilience, which is just a global platform. <laughs> I'm almost done. Okay. Um, and we found out that it was very hard to get our foot in the door with those bigger organizations. And we had to adapt by looking for other networks that are already strong in resilience and advocacy that were that were interested in our messages and start to work with them. And that was the lesson that we learned from our initiative. Simone, I'm sorry if I went over 10 minutes, but that's- No, no, that's... no worries. It was great. Uh, thanks okay. so much. I'm sure there will be lots of questions for you um, from the group and maybe um, people if you're participating, any questions for Peter or from others in the, in the, the, of the speakers, please start typing them in the chat box because that's the way we will we'll work through them. I'll also have, um, a special request for people or a moment where people on the phone can can shout out but uh, that will come quickly so um please start typing your questions in the chat box if you have any uh, but and before we go into the q a i wanted to invite uh, claire Rhodes from produce direct to briefly share some res the reflections from her as well hey claire thanks everyone um really great to connect and share examples of feedback um just wanted to reassure everyone that i'm not in the habit of encouraging people to sleep on patios that's that was a one-off just to just to be really clear on that um yeah so i think um one of the really interesting things for us as producers direct with our experience um as grantees for the original uh, grp challenge and then also beneficiaries of the scaling funds which was fantastic is the fact that almost the scaling funds enabled us to act on some of the, the failures and the solutions we developed to address our failures in the original project. So I'll just give an example of that and a few reflections. Um, our original GRP project was really focused on how to support smallholders to test and adopt different uh, digital technologies to support them with resilience. Uh, ranging from uh, technologies to support farmer to farmer knowledge sharing to accessing markets uh, through to actually digitizing on farm record keeping and um, we did that um, in Kenya and Uganda and um, a little bit in, in Tanzania and scaling. So one of the big lessons that we learned um, in the first um, GRP kind of two years was essentially that um, a lot of analog or in-person uh, support was required in order to make um, any new digital tool that was designed and developed by farmers successful. So um, in our original uh, project we were partnering with some quite big uh, corporate partners like MasterCard and they had this, this business model where you know they'd want to come in rapidly design a prototype to support market access, uh, do, it, do it really quickly and then you know scale it out very quickly in a very commercial way. Um, and you know our approach of working with farmers wasn't very consistent with what um, their sort of time frames for moving on it was. Um, so what that resulted in was a digital tools that 
in itself standalone wasn't fit for purpose. But what, um, and so that we considered as a bit of a failure, but then um, in order to address that, we spent a lot of time um, investing in youth leaders within the communities to learn about these digital tools and then provide the support services in person that the digital tools weren't actually um, providing to the farmers. So for example, uh, the digital tool was meant to be helping farmers to access markets, but actually the digital tool wasn't providing any solutions for the farmers to physically get the product from their farm to a buyer. And so uh, without that support, uh, nothing was happening with the digital tool. So we invested in youth leaders to then actually come in, uh, provide the logistic services for uh, collecting the products, aggregating them and selling them. So in that respect, um, the failure from the first uh, project then enabled us to invest in youth leader networks during the scaling project and really enable that to, to scale. But then we face more problems. So, um, you know, as Peter was saying, it's a really great analogy. You sort of you, you look at one part of the system and then something else needs addressing once you've, you've done that. So then what? So, so now we're facing a challenge of how you develop a long term business model to support those youth uh, with those incentives to continue providing those services. And so that, therefore you get the next challenge. So I guess the reflection was that for, for us, it was fantastic to have that ongoing support from GRP and the flexibility to turn failure into success uh, for the scaling. But now we've got more things that we need to address uh, moving forward. Um, and I think, you know, a, reflect, a reflection also is that typically most donors don't provide that ongoing support the GRP has. And with the time bound nature of projects, it then becomes, as Peter was saying, really challenging to take a, a systemic approach to the problem. Also in general, uh, when you're submitting proposals uh, to, to new donors, they, they want you to simplify your issues, not necessarily have this massively complex set of challenges. And I think that was a learning from us as well around how, how you do submit these um, system-wide solutions uh, to uh, typical donors who would uh, prefer a sort of more streamlined, uh, simple approach to the pro problem. So I think GRP in that respect is a bit of an exception. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you for that opportunity. Thanks, Claire. That was great. Um, that was it. I think I will, if any of the grantees have further inputs to give them, they can uh, let me know. Um, that was really helpful, Claire uh, and Peter, as well as the other speakers. Um, we have not so much time left, so I'll just go, go, I'm just going to go straight to the Q&A, um, just uh, as a matter of um, yeah, the, the recording will be shared uh, after this, as well as the slides and the reports are, it's already accessible on the website, oops. Um, I had a question here, um, which I quite like, but I'm going to give to, uh, to Sarah anyway. It's about the mail systems for, um, yeah, what does a failure sensitive mail system look like? A question from Bob Ramadan. Um, Sarah, do you have any reflections on that? Um, do you have any examples to share? Well, the thing I would say about it is that uh, there's a difference between looking for failure when you're doing assessment, when you're doing mail, and embracing it as part of what you're doing. And to my mind, the important bit is about the shortened, more dynamic cycles. So what we're looking at is uh, um, rapid learning. So we're really looking at what is happening. And that includes things that aren't happening well, as well as things that are happening well. Um, like so, and this whole thing about doing plan, do, study, act cycles around different parts of your project. So really focusing on one bit and saying, okay, so what are we do? What are we planning to do here? Doing it, studying it, acting on those results. So having something more functioned around because a dynamism of cycles of change rather than very firmly structured on long term outcomes, which you can also do, but making sure that you've got those cycles underneath it. That's what I would say to that. Um, there are, there are some things probably that I could share around those shorter cycles of change, which I've got your emails in the chat, so I can have a look for something like that and send it over to you if that's helpful. Great, thanks. And um, uh, was another question on the resilience principles that were used for the scalability assessment. Um, Jasper can, he will give some final reflections uh, after the Q&A, but um, what I can tell you is that we have our resilience principles for GRP online now, and for the scalability before um, or when the these have been developed more recently, when Jasper did a scaling assessment, he used the Stockholm Resilience Center uh, resilience principles, which are on their website. So you can find them there. Um, 
Let's see, uh, as I scroll to the questions, maybe if someone who is calling in has a question, just unmute yourself or start speaking. And if a lot of people start speaking at the same time, then we'll have to find a way to sort that. So I'll give a few seconds for that. Anyone from the phone? You may have to unmute if you're speaking. No, then that's okay. Then there was another question from Lisa who also asked a question on the, on the resilience principles. Is there a known set of social institutions known to accommodate and embrace failure and that promote learning from failure? Um, Jasper, Sarah, who wants to take that one? Um, I, well, the um, first thing that springs to mind in the UK and Nesta are particularly good at looking at, at failure and at innovation. So these organisations that look at um, how innovation works. <clears throat> I find that people who work with um, social enterprise in the UK, there's quite a few people who are doing some quite interesting work around that, that kind of um, learning and adapt adapting from failure. But yeah, Nesta is someone I would look at in the UK at the moment. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Jesper. So you were so quick. Um, um, I think, yeah, I think that's a good, good example. I think start looking there and then uh, also um, uh, reach out to me um, if you want to have a, a discussion about it. There are, it depends. Um, it depends on, on what it is that you're doing and so on and what it is that you want to um, address. You have internal issues and you have external issues. Uh, where does this failure um, come from? Where does it stem from? And, and you need to, you need to, identify that so simple tools for that um, and then when you um, when you address maybe you're failing from a resilience perspective but then you need to look at it through that lens and see why am I not building resilience in, 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 uh, uh, through my initiative um, so there are simple tools for that so it, it depends on, on exactly what it is you want to look at um, but I would suggest you send me an email and we can have a, a conversation Thanks, Jasper. And I think our hope it answers uh, Mohammed's question as well about if there are any generic tools to assess failure, uh, which can be customized for specific projects. So maybe if you have questions, that do contact Jasper about that. Uh, we have another question from Steph, and um, that relates to another one from Le Tirail. Sorry if I pronounce you incorrectly. Um, what has been GRP's funders' reaction or response to reporting of any such failures? And Jeff, uh, Steph asks, um, in your experience, are you seeing good or positive reactions from donors funders if learning leads to fundamental changes in the project scope? Or do they view it as a nuisance? Jasper, I'm going to give this one to you or to Dion. Uh, or maybe both, I can, I can start maybe. Um, uh, I, I, over, the, over the five years of, of working with GRP, uh, there's always been an openness to, to failure, but, um, but I think it has, in, increased um, we have noticed when we have uh, public forums when we do workshops and so on that uh, the funders donors uh, very often are very keen on on failure and they don't have a problem with it um, i know that usaid for example they will have failure fests um, i know that's the case for uh, for some other donors as well um, because you have to you have to acknowledge that you have been failing and you need to learn something from it and you need to move on the, the best way to create a, um, a conducive environment for change because that's what we're all trying to do in, in a way change and um, influencing either on the ground or at policy level or somewhere in between uh, through different models that we put in place and we try to distribute things or we try to organize the collection of things or we try to improve something it's change we're after. The, the best way to, to create a conducive environment for change is to create a burning platform. You have to jump off it onto something else. And, and I think if, we, if you look globally today, the, the, the big signs are that we need to really address this stuff. Um, and it's all the more relevant and, and, and uh, 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 urgent given the, the COVID situation that's happening now. But we have seen it. Um, it does differ from donor to donor. Um, it depends on, on what they're after and how risk averse they are. Some donors um, rely heavily, obviously, on, on all donors rely heavily on, on, uh, on taxpayers. Um, sometimes they need to protect themselves um, there. Uh, but uh, if you build the failure into the process of coming out with something better at the end, it, it, can, it can be justified. 
Thanks, Jesper. Um, we have Jamie from the USA here on the phone as well, and she's happy to reflect on this as well. So, Jamie, over to you. Uh, yes, yeah, I think uh, just to echo it, um, or to perhaps bolster what Jesper and others have said, um, no one goes into a project hoping to fail, um, but we do have a very strong um, uh, focus on CLA, so collaborating, learning, and adapting, uh, which we definitely um, uh, encourage our partners and, and, often, and usually require it that they incorporate that piece into all of their projects. And I think from the perspective of resilience programming, we very much are focused on being um, adaptive and being able to, uh, encouraging our partners to adapt, be flexible enough to adapt programming um, when shocks occur. And so equally when things aren't working, um, you know, to, to learn from that and figure out how to, how to essentially um, pivot and, and really look towards achieving the original objectives. And then certainly when we're, we're um, engaging in designing new activities, um, one of the first things that we do is go back and look at, at sort of lessons learned from, from prior efforts and use that to really inform um, you know, future design so that we as an agency are also just continually learning from, from what we've done in the past. Over. Thanks, Jamie. That was very helpful. I don't see further questions and also we are running out of time. So I hope you can still bear with us for a few minutes more because we have a final poll for you guys to answer. And as we have the poll up, I'm going to ask Jasper to give some final reflections for a minute or two and he'll see the, the results coming in so he can speak to those as well. Uh, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll close it uh, for my end here. So thanks all for joining. Over to Jasper now and um, I look forward to your responses to, the, to this poll. Uh, well, thank you very much for your attention um, and uh, engagement and the chat then with the questions. Um, um, I, I, I'm just going to repeat what's been said uh, a little bit, which I think you know what it's going to be. Um, failing is something that can be a value. Obviously, we don't want to fail. What, what, what Jamie said is, is absolutely right. No one goes into something thinking, ah, yeah, let's fail, um, and, and then we'll take it from there. You, you want to put as much effort as you can into not uh, building a, something, a model, uh, building a project, building an initiative that will not fail, but it's very likely to happen and because that's reality. And you need to, to take that reality and work with it. And instead of discarding it, instead of, of getting rid of the whole thing, try to learn from it and move forward. As you look at uh, what the, the, the underlying reasons for the failure, you need to, to look at everything. Uh, including yourself. You need to reflect on what you did. You need to um, reflect on, on what events happened and so on. And, and also remember that you're doing this in the most uh, complex and challenging environment uh, and dynamics that you can imagine. Um, doing a, a startup or, or uh, starting a project anywhere in the world is difficult. Doing it in vulnerable and exposed uh, uh, areas with vulnerable and exposed uh, communities is all the harder because stuff happens and you have no idea. There's no way you can plan for it. Um, so you need to have the agility uh, and you need to have that open mind and you need to, um, you need to push back uh, on, on yourself as well. Um, align the expectations right. Try to learn and move forward and always think, always think forward. Uh, I, you know, it's four o'clock sharp now um, uh, where I am. Uh, so we had an hour. Um, Simone, do you want to say any final words? Otherwise, I'll, I just want to say thank you for, for your attention and, and it's uh, great to see all of you here. Yeah, thanks so much for joining. Uh, that was it. I uh, hope to see you during the next, web next webinar. Have a great day.